things. Can you hear me? Let me know in the comments if you can hear. No, I want that on. What's that do? No, I don't want that one. No filter. Let's get rid of that. Oh. Okay. How do I show the chat? Um, let me know if you can see what's going on here and if you can hear the sound. Chat viewing options. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Let me know if you can see this. Uh, welcome to the live stream. This is my first one I've done of these on YouTube as a part of this. Um, yeah, so let me know if, if you can hear everything. Hopefully my microphone here is working and what have you. Um, and you're hearing proper audio. Um, that would be really great. Where are we on this one? Let's have a look. Um, anyone's got any questions, let me know. Happy to answer them. Uh, I'm going to play some music for you today. So that'll be cool. Let's have a look at this. What was that sound? No connection. There we go. Can you hear the guitar? Can you hear the guitar? Great. Can you hear the track? Let me know if you hear this. Um, like I said, it's the first time doing it. Because I'll play along to that, that'd be great to do. Um, hopefully you can hear that. Chat viewing options. Um, anyway, so um, 100 episodes of doing this um, on YouTube every day. I can't believe I've actually got, got that... Um, oh, thank you. Um, guitar coming through. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I can't believe I've got to a hundred episodes of doing this. That's crazy. Um, you know what I mean? I didn't miss a day. Like, yeah. Um, so I thought today what I'll do is I'll play some guitar. I will, um, I'm going to play along to some tracks of mine, some tunes. I'm going to play a couple of standards that have been requested by people. Um, let's just change that slightly. That's better. Um, I had a couple of requests for standards, so I'm going to play those. If you want to know, thank you, thank you, yeah, hundredth, congrats, one hundredth. <laughs> Can't believe it. Um, if there's anything you want to know, then please let me know. Um, thank you, thank you, Stefan. Um, anything you want to know, then let me know. Um, I've got some questions that people have already asked, so I will do those. And start with playing a tune of mine called Pablito's Chicken um, from the album Reamped. Uh, this one. I used an app um, called Moises to remove the guitar, so it worked. Pretty amazing app, it's just, um, if you guys don't know that one, it's an app, it's an AI app where AI filters the track. Anyway, here, here we go. This is with Ben Shepard and Dylan Alice. Thank you. 
that was Pablito's Chicken, or at least a little portion of it um, going into the bass solo without Ben actually here playing it. Um, thanks, thanks Ben, awesome. Um, and thank you Jason as well, that, that's very kind of you to say. Um, yeah, it's, I can't believe I've got to a hundred of these, it's, cra it's crazy. So if there's anything particularly you want to know, um, then fire me a comment and I will answer it if I can. But I had a comment here from Jess. Um, from Rotorua, New Zealand, said had some very nice comments to start with and said we can break down how you promote chromaticism and how I can utilize chromaticism in my playing. Um, okay, so chromaticism. It's actually much simpler than a lot of people think. Like if you if you know, say you only know pentatonic, right? <laughs> Something like that maybe, right? Um, the thing I'd suggest to start with is start looking at what notes like make sense to put a chromatic passing note in because chroma chromatic notes are passing notes, right? If you have this note and this note, well, that's right in the middle, right? But we're not going to go... It just sounds out of place. You're going to go... Right, now you've passed chromatically into that other one. Could be somewhere to start. I think um, it's a really good, always a really good idea to do um, enclosures too. Enclosures are such a classic part of jazz that if I have these four notes, right, go, right, so I go down three notes, and on one note above the, the note I'm going to end on, I go to a note below, and then come into, right, and those always make make a lot more sense, and of course. The thing is, <coughs> excuse me, if you play with good rhythm, then it's like it's all going to make sense. If you play with crappy rhythm, it doesn't matter what you do, it's just still crappy. So, so you know, always make a point of like really trying to swing hard and, and like right in the pocket. Um, and that'll make chromatic things just make more sense. Uh, I had a request for Caravan, I will we'll play that at some point. Um, another 10 hour blues session. <laughs> I've done the 5 hour blues, I ain't never doing that again, it was basically nearly killed me a cup of coffee because it's 10 a.m. in the morning here in New Zealand um, it's actually my second cup of coffee <laughs> but that's how it goes um, it's, but he said but really can we get your take on Robin Ford's diminished ideas um, I oh, thank you uh, do you follow the process when you build your solos like where you're playing blue boss or daddy gradually playing your build up um, yeah so I when I'm practicing I do have a have a plan for what I'm going to do. I'll work on various different concepts. Maybe I'll go, okay, I'm going to practice playing like really pretty on this. Maybe I'm going to start really simple and build up and then but then tail it back down. Or maybe I'm going to start really busy and kind of just have this kind of progression on my solo. Or the other way around. All kinds of things, right? But when I play, like for real, on a gig or whatever, I never think about anything I do. Um, I literally, I'm, I'm trying to be as in the moment as I can. I'm not trying to preconceive things. Um because it, it almost always never works for me. It just goes wrong, like, right? I'll have this cool lick and I'll go, I'm gonna play this cool lick like right now and everyone's gonna go, yeah, that's great. Um, this Charlie Parker thing or whatever I've been working on, you know? And then invariably the drummer might play a fill that, that totally clashes with my lick because they don't know what my lick was gonna be, right? And so therefore what ends up happening is like, now my idea doesn't work and I'm like, ah. Instead what I'm better to do is listen, if I hear their fill, then maybe I could play something that complements their fill right so yeah I don't tend to plan too much when I play um, but I mean you can't go wrong with the classic bell curve right that something builds up to a peak in the middle and then comes back down um, that, that's always a good place to start but generally I, I try not to plan I try to just go with the moment and kind of and I ask myself questions all the time um, there was another question here about what I think about when I improvise which is related to the same question and that was from Ants yeah, and said, I would like to hear about what you're thinking while you are improvising. Are you making decisions based on your theoretical knowledge or scale, shapes, and chords? So yeah, I do think about theory. I do think about where the notes are on the fretboard. I can't help it. Like, I've just done that for so long. And of course, I read music, like, a lot. Like, I'm I'm known as a reader. Um, so therefore, I can't help but see that as a G note, B flat, D, etc., etc. So to me, it's like, I just can't help but kind of do those sorts of things, um, but I try not to. I try to just like let, follow my ear and follow my instinct and listen when I'm when I'm playing for real. Um, yeah, 
do you put on a different hat and playing a rock tune would you approach it fusioning 100 percent yeah when i play rock stuff i play completely different um i'm gonna get a different sound for a start it's gonna make me play different if this is my sound i have when i'm playing jazz stuff i'll be like vocabulary is different so I'll, yeah when I'm playing Brock stuff um, but at the end of the day it's still all just me you know what I mean like it's this you know I try to use this guitar as much as one of the reasons this has become my number one guitar is I can do all my gigs on this thing For, like you heard there a rock sound <laughs> Different rock face, yeah, probably. Um, you know, and then and I'm in jazz mode, right? Same guitar. Uh, I could go like this. To like a funk sound yeah it does it does neck dive a little bit this guitar so um yeah someone asked is, is does it neck dive sorry i missed your name because the, the, co the comments gone so quickly um it does neck dive a little bit because it's it's a hollow body guitar and it's a really small guitar it's not a big guitar like a lot of other guitars so it does have a tendency to to neck dive like an sg would a gibson sg so the solution is just to put your strap there and then doesn't do it. I mean, maybe it will a little bit if you have a strap that's really slippery. It'll probably would do that a little bit, depending how you sit. But I also find with this guitar, it's it's a little bit uncomfortable to put it straight on my leg, because you know I'm 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 a reasonably big guy. I'm six foot, uh, just under six foot, and it's sort of you know I want you know like a three three five would put my arm in this position. This guitar makes me want to do this, so I, I want to have the strap and I want to have it about there. Really, that's where it feels most comfortable. But I tell you, I don't, I don't miss having the weight of the guitar. Like this thing weighs six pound and a half, I think it is. Um, slightly under seven, maybe somewhere around that, which is about ideal, right? I've played, I've got a Les Paul there and I played that and that thing is like back breaking. I like the tone. It sounds great, but it's killer on your back. Um, and I just, I can't do that anymore. Um, I'm getting too old for it. Um, yeah, this, this is a suede strap. This actually, this strap was, was a very generous gift gift from my friend Bruce Foreman. Um, if you don't know Bruce Foreman, he's one of the baddest dudes on the planet. Um, Bruce bought this for me. It was, it's one of, I, I care about this more than I care about my guitar because <laughs> it's, you know, it's so, um, such a beautiful thing that Bruce did. It's a handmade Italian leather strap um, and it's suede on the inside. So suede definitely makes a difference as well because it'll grip against your shirt. But um, yeah, this is, this is the one and it's really thick leather. It's the kind of strap you'd have for a lifetime. So it was awesome that Bruce bought that for me. I was super stoked with that. Um, I think he bought two, bought himself one and bought me one at the same time then posted it. So that was pretty cool. Bruce and I go way back. So um, yeah, so do I think theoretical knowledge or shapes and chords? Yes, I do. But but hopefully when I'm um, when I'm playing, the, uh, I've got all that stuff down so that I don't need to be thinking about it. I can just do it. That's the plan, right? Um, do you have a mental data bank of core licks you will know know will always work absolutely so if i'm playing like a rhythm changes and i know it's going to have that one six two five i know i'm going to have some one six two five licks so for example right right i know that hits all the key, key notes i want on the chord as i'm doing it so to me, that's like a lick that I know I can pull out. If all else is turning to, to shit, I can go, there's that lick and it's going to work for me, right? Um, or, or even just part of it. Maybe I'll go. Right, I, I didn't play the same lick, but now I played something that was based off 
based off it and to some degree. Um, so I do have licks that I know will always work and get me out of, like you get out of jail free card, but I try not to use them. I try to, you know, hopefully I've done those licks enough and they just come out and you're playing. For me, what I found is like if I play, um, if I play things and I just keep working on it, working on it, working on it, usually it takes me about three months of playing. And our students are often surprised when they hear that. They're like, three months? And I'm like, yeah, like, like I can do it, like, pretty much straight away. That's not the point. The point is that I want it to come out naturally. Like, I'll be on a gig, I'm not thinking, and all of a sudden that lick comes out, and I haven't thought about it and whatever, and then I go, ah, it's now in my playing. And generally that's about three months I've found with most stuff, right? And that's the point I want to get to. If, if it's not coming out naturally, I don't tend to do it. Um, but like I said, when I'm doing YouTube videos, it's different. When I'm practicing, it's different. Like all scenarios are different, but I'm talking about a truly improvised um, jazz gig, right? Or jazz of sorts, right? I don't really do that many like straight ahead jazz gigs. Um, I've done a couple lately, but generally I do probably 10 or so a year straight ahead jazz gigs. Most of my stuff is kind of fusion-y orientated. That's, that's really where my heart lies. Um, even though my background is in playing jazz and swing and bebop and stuff like that. Are you singing every note in your head while you're playing? A hundred percent. That's how I'm doing it. It's actually like someone screaming the notes at me inside my head. Um, you know, because I'm trying I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hear my way through it more than trying to anything else. You know, where's the melody taking me, right? Is it some sort of autopilot thing? Yeah, it is. Um, oh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, it's very kind of you. Um, is it some sort of autopilot thing? Yeah, definitely. I, there's a bit of autopilot in it. And that's actually a good thing. Um, the, the gigs where I feel I've played my absolute best, um, I've watched back on them on, on video or whatever, and I've, most of the time it's when I'm not thinking, right? I remember playing with Brandon Fields, the great saxophone player from LA, and he was out here, um, killer player, um, you know, he's in Weckl's band and all kinds of things, like he's, he's been around forever and played on some legendary albums and what have you, um, but I remember doing a concert with him and I just kind of let go and just went with it. And it was on the tune So What. It's actually on my YouTube channel. It's an old video. But it was the tune So What, which I've played since I was like 15 years old. So I didn't have to think. And I just let go and I just played. And I listened back to that. And it was almost like I remember at the time it almost being like it was someone else moving my fingers more than me. I wasn't trying. I was just letting, letting things flow, right? And that was some of, the, some of the best playing I think I did that year probably, right? And there's some, been some experiences where I've had that happen, where I've just kind of played and it's like something happens something takes over and that's uh that's really cool um yeah so thanks ants for your question uh robin ford's diminished scale thing so really the stuff i hear him using i don't really hear him using diminished as in the as diminished right like if it's uh i recently discovered you uh, uh, Oh, yeah, um, this guitar, I didn't even know it existed. I was in the music shop, it was sitting up on the wall. I've had my 420, which is the same thing, but not hollow for a while. I really dig that guitar. It's like a Les Paul, but but a little bit little bit more versatile, I find. Um, and that's also on the wall. I was like, what the hell is that? The hollow body version of the guitar I already have, you know? Um, so I borrowed it from the music shop, because they're really good like that. And I was just like, I gotta have that one. And, you know, this just works for me. It's not perfect. There are things about it I would change if I had my own way. Like, I've, I've already done a couple of changes to it. <laughs> As I can't help it, I, I changed out the neck pickup. I, I did a video on the mods I've done on this guitar, so um, check that out if you haven't already. But, yeah, I'd, I'd modify all my guitars. But, I mean, if I had a custom guitar, it would be really cool. That, that would be the goal one day, to have a custom. Um, I thought I might play the Days of Wine and Roses. I had a request from someone for this, and this is such a beautiful tune. I've always liked this tune a lot.
So that was the days of Wine and Roses, um, a famous Henry Mancini tune. Um, you'll know Henry Mancini, of course, for the... Right, the Pink Panther theme was the other one that he wrote. That, well, that's his most famous song. Um, but yeah, he was definitely a, a great, prolific songwriter, composer. Um, oh, thanks. That's very, yeah, yeah. Hit the thumbs up if you like this, people. Um, and, and yeah, I just appreciate everyone tuning in. I mean, it's awesome that, that people are interested to see this. And I haven't done a live stream on my channel before, so I've been thinking, like, maybe I'll do... I, I did a post a little while ago and said, you know, would people tune in if I do this regularly? Um, then, sure, if people want to watch, man, I'm into it. That's the whole reason I'm do I've got to 100 of these episodes of doing this, was that I, if people are interested in it, Right. If people are not interested in it, then why, why bother doing it? But if people want to see it, um, I, I'm into it. Um, I've got a gig coming up this week too, and I just did a video today, which is actually going to come out tomorrow, and it's um, I'm playing video game music. I know. It's a, a game called Stardew Valley. I don't know. It kind of looks a little bit like... Um, thanks, Chris. Um, it, it, a little bit like uh, Minecraft, but, you know, sort of that sort of blocky type thing. But it's, yeah, unusual game. Um, anyway, i got to play this music with a chamber orchestra. So um, I, there are some sort of beats to it, but a lot of it's really quite floaty and rubato. And um, so I just started working on that. The gig's on Friday. It's Wednesday today. So I had a look at the music yesterday. Um, I had a look at, the, look at it before, um, but... I, I spent some time with the MP3s yesterday. They sent through some MP3s. So I was kind of playing along with it and looking at it. And there's some tricky stuff in there. There's one I talk about in, in a video that comes out tomorrow. Goes. Uh. So, G, E, G. And then the same thing with a B. Then a G. And then a D. An acoustic guitar <laughs> right and I was like man who writes stuff like this <laughs> it's tricky it says um, there's a little note there saying you can adjust the octave if necessary but it, it doesn't it's even probably harder down lower yeah it just doesn't sound, doesn't sound as good um, and I heard it on the recording the, the guitar player did it managed to do it so I was like oh well challenge accepted right that's why I like taking on gigs like that, you know, is this, um, I've made a list of the things that I'm working on, and, and you'll see in the video that comes out tomorrow, I kind of showed you all the, the process about how I'm going to kind of work on these things. Um, it's, it's a challenge, you know what I mean? Like, and, and that's a good thing. I think if you're a musician and you're not challenging yourself, then you're going, you're, you're not really going sideways, you're actually going backwards. That's why I'm always like, always learning new tunes. That's one of the best things you can do is just learn new tunes. I'm always like trying to get better, especially now. Like I'm working harder now than I probably ever have. Maybe not as much as when I was a teenager. And the only difference is when I was a teenager, I had um I had the time to right. Um, when I was a teenager, I could practice eight hours a day. I wish I could do that now. I just can't. I mean, the rest of my day after this live stream will will be um, uh, going to the post office and sending off some recordings that I did. Um, a session for someone it was actually easier to post it. I know that's crazy, isn't it? You think you just use you send it, but we ended up with all this data, and it's just like it would take a week to upload or something. So it was like, man, I'll put on a USB key and I'll just send it to. Um, I'm sending a copy to Alaska and then a copy to LA, um, but it's like it's just quicker to send <laughs> USB keys. And actually, crazy enough, the, those little USB keys, you know, I found a couple for like 30, 40 bucks each. I think they were. I was like, well, that's pretty reasonable, you know what I mean? And just chuck them in an envelope and send it over. And um, But usually you can just send files on the internet. That's usually the easiest way to do it. But in this case, I couldn't. Way too much data, because there's video as well. And I think it ended up about 170 gigabytes each. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that's my day. I'm going to be posting that today. I'm going to be doing some practice today for this, this show on Friday. And i make sure my gear's all going. Um, the Martin, I haven't plugged the Martin in in a while. I want to make sure the pickup's all going, all that kind of stuff. Any maintenance on those. I've got to play banjo to make sure my banjo's all good and going. Um, 
Yeah, so, um, anyway, let's find another track. Where are we? Um, any particular tunes people want to hear? If so, let me know. Why don't I do, I do rhythm changes? Because I just did a video on that the other day. I like playing, I like playing, playing rhythm changes. I know everyone's scared of rhythm changes. And that's kind of fair. It's a 24 hour. Okay, so we're going to have an ad on there. Let's get rid of the ad for a minute. Yeah, and I mean, rhythm changes doesn't have to be crazy hard. It's the same as any other progression. If you work on it, it becomes a natural thing and you sort of learn how to navigate it. Um, and navigating it really is just about being able to hit chord changes, be able to play good melodies, all those sorts of things that we do with, with say, a blues tune. Except it's a different form now. Let's see if that's going to work. Okay, let's take it down a touch.
I was amazed I even remembered anthropology. <laughs> I was getting to the end there and I started going, and I've kind of put this reference this. So I thought, oh, why don't I just play anthropology as the out here? And um, the Charlie Parker tune. It's been a long time since I played that tune. It's too early for that kind of carry on in the morning here. <laughs> it's uh, 10.32 a.m. So if you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, so um, it's 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 a funny thing. I I often find in the morning, like, I don't, I don't play as well in the morning. I'm not a morning person for a start. It's like my brain's not really a active. I see you enjoy your own play. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I try to. Sometimes I really don't enjoy my own phrasing. <laughs> um, sometimes I'll play things and I just go, God, what the hell are you doing, Nick? That was a load of crap. Um, I think we all feel like that, though, right? Like, I... um. I saw this video of Sting, and Sting was talking about how he doesn't like his own playing. <laughs> and uh, his own singing, I should say. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is a, it's, it's going to be a cool gig doing the one um, um, on Friday. I mean, I always enjoy those. It's, a, it's with a conductor, and that's a really hard thing. So what I have to do is I read the music. I have the music here, um, and I'm... And I split my vision between the two, which is not that easy, you know what I mean? And, and if there's any bits that are really key, I'll, I'll memorize them and get them off the page so that I can just eagle eye the conductor and be like, you know, um, because, you know, they're giving you the beat. So it's, if they're in 4-4, four, four, it's, it's always 1 is the downbeat, 2 is inside, 3 out, 4 is up. So if I look up at any point, I know which, like if I see the hand go out, I know, oh, that's 3, not 2, right? Um, but 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. If it's in 3, it's 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. I think that's how 3 works. Um, a lot of the stuff is in 3, 4, so I'm going to have to do that. But it, but the interesting thing too is like classical musicians tend to play really late. Like they don't, pl you'd think 1 is there. No, they go 1. Like almost halfway back up, and I've heard, heard, I've spoken with various classical musicians I know well, and various people in the orchestra and stuff, and they say that they're actually trying to play it on the bottom of the beat, but the sound comes out late out of their instrument. Really, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's true, but that's what they say. Um, but there is an interesting blend when you have a full orchestra because you know, like your trumpets at the black back will actually play early, so that the sound reaches the conductor by the time everything all blends. And that kind of stuff is crazy to think about right so for me a lot of the times I'm just using my ear because you know if I'm seeing someone conducting and it's like the bottom of the stick is here but they're playing late um it's it's that's that's hard to do you know what I mean it's like um it's like if you heard a click in your ear and it was out of time with what you were seeing um it's very very confusing um oh you bought a, a, a 520 Search the guitar after I bought and <laughs> bought the ah oh cool oh thank you um no this is not full hollow body it has a little bit of a block um not under the neck pickup it is actually kind of about here and about here it's like a center block just that part so that's one of the reasons I think the neck pickup sounds really dark on this guitar um the the because it's it's completely hollow here and it's not hollow here the two pickups have different wood underneath them so that's one of the reasons I changed this to go with a brighter pickup I went for I got Mr Glenn um Glenn Evans a guy in New Zealand to custom make me a pickup and it's basically a PAF but five percent um, underwound so it's a little brighter and that balanced better with the two pickups um, I've still got it down quite low but it balanced better with the two pickups um, it had more of a jazz tone. Um, I found that I, I, I actually wanted more more brightness from it. I can always make it more jazzy by turning down the tonal stuff. But if I don't have the brightness to start with, that's hard to bring back. Um, oh, you enjoyed episode 89, five tips to improve your improvised soloing. Yeah, that video, um, it's been interesting. I put a bunch of um, things I thought were good in there and it, it hasn't sort of... Um, being watched as much as I thought people would. I thought that was something that people would. But then, you know, I've, I've given up on trying to figure out what people want out of this stuff sometimes. Um, I did a video on those Fender FRs, the FR12, the, the full, the, you know, the modeler amps. They had the 12 and the 10, and, and then I've got my little head rush here um, and did a comparison of them. And that, in the last month, has been the best performing video that I've had. It's had nearly 10,000 views in a month and a bit, um, which, you know, if, if I'm getting to a thousand to two thousand views in a month on a video, I'm I'm happy, um, and I thought it was crazy. And I looked at the analytics last night, and 
Um, it was dudes between 45 and 65, all Americans and mostly Americans. Most, 99%, not 99%, at least half was Americans between that age group of guys. And I thought, oh, that's very interesting that it was such a specific group of people that were looking for that thing. And I talked to my wife about it. So I wonder why guys that age in the US are, are, what, are searching out that thing. Because most of the people that watched that video weren't subscribed to my channel. Um, and I think maybe it is that people wanting a lighter, more portable setup. But I'd have thought that age group was pretty old school in their approach and would want tube amps. Do you know what I mean? So I thought, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do have a different rock face. <laughs> Do you put on a different hat playing a rock chain? Yep, I talked about that. Sounds great. Oh, I'm glad the tracks and the stuff is everything's coming through. Um, oh man, thanks. Yeah, it's interesting. But I mean, people have watched it. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not against that. I did wonder when I first started doing YouTube videos, like. You know, a long time ago, I put up my first video. If the only person who was watching it was my mum, <laughs> and she was watching the same video over and over again. <laughs> Any questions? Anything you want to know about guitar? You're in the Midwest of the USA, and it's 6:33 p.m. here. Yeah. So the, one of the reasons I chose 10 a.m. in the morning in New Zealand is that that seemed to be when my the largest portion of my audience were on this. Um, you know, because New Zealand. Um, it's about 5% of my audience, I think about 25% is people in the US. Um, so trying to find a time zone that worked for everyone is tricky when you're in this country because, you know, we're, New Zealand is a day here, it's Wednesday morning at 10am here and it'll be Tuesday evening in the States there. The note on my 520 seems cut slightly too low. But good enough for me now, bedroom potatoes. Might get someone to get a new one and do the mod you did with the strap. But I like the neck pickup. Yeah, um, I, I know someone else who bought this guitar. A friend of mine, um, Andrea Lisa. Really great, kind of smooth jazz guitar player, I guess you'd say, in LA. And she's, she's originally from Auckland in New Zealand. She bought one and she's, she was saying that the neck pickup sounded really good in her one. So maybe it was just this combination of wood and things with the pickup that it had was too dark. Dunno. Every guitar is different, remember? Um, and I think that's part of it. Like... I always, whenever I get a new guitar, I always play it for a while first. I never like go straight to doing mods on guitar. And and the reason for that is that, you know, when you, you've got to get to know the instrument and how it's going to respond and what it's going to do. And sometimes two instruments just take a minute to break in. You know, they haven't been played and all of a sudden you're playing it and everything's kind of adjusting and it's it's finding its equilibrium. Um, I run 11 to 49 elixirs on here. Um, so the first thing I did have to do was get it set up because it came with 10s and of course the neck went eh, as soon as it had heavier strings so I got that adjusted, got the action set I like quite a low action um, uh, like BB King said, like why work harder than you have to? <laughs> I don't want too low action that it chokes out like see even acoustically there's no there's no buzzing anywhere on the neck, you know, that's sort of the, one of the key things. Maybe about two millimeters overall, I think I think it is. Um, you know, this is a 1.14 mil pick, and that fits in there super easy with a gap. So I'd guess about two mil um, is what I typically go for. And then I'll play it for a while. Um, I did have the nut replaced with a bone nut, um, mostly because when I went up to from 10s to 11s, the 11s were catching in the nut because, you know, was set up for a different set of things. So was like, if they're going to be cut anyway, we might as well replace it and just get a bone nut in there. Um, I remember talking to my tech um, about that, and he was saying that the nut really only affects the um, the open strings. Which is interesting, because I'd have thought that if you play like a D note here, where if I play that note, you would think the influence of what's going on here would affect it. But I guess what's happening is essentially you're taking like an open string, and then you're moving the the relative position of where the nut is. So it doesn't have any influence on that, or maybe minimal. So I didn't notice any difference in that, but I noticed that maybe when I was playing open, I didn't I didn't really notice any difference other than um, we got we changed it over and maybe it um it maybe it holds better tuning now. Um, I don't really use the tri switching that much to be honest. Most of the time I just leave it on. So even then, I'd accidentally changed it for another sound. I forgot to put it back. Um, 
it's it's useful. Um, occasionally I'll like you know maybe I'll go into the middle position, both pickups, and I'll just tap the neck to take a little weight out of it. I'll show you what that sounds like. So if we're here. See here, there, it's sort of, um, it just takes a little bit of weight out of it. The problem I've found is sometimes I'll I'll go to hit the, the pickup selector and I bump that one up and all of a sudden I'm playing and I can't figure out why I've got no real, no real presence. And then I realize, oh, I've actually bumped the, that switch up. So I think if, if I have had a custom guitar made, I would, I would do away with the tri switches um, and I would actually have a real single coil in there in the middle. Um, and have a five way so that I could get the real single coil in the middle. It is useful to have them because you know they add another flavor and like I said sometimes I do go into that middle position especially on funk stuff. Funk stuff I don't want the full thickness of the neck pickup so I'll just coil tap that one pickup. Um, I don't particularly like the sound of both pickups tapped. You know I think the humbucker sounds better full and the, the neck pickup split. So that's what I'll do if I, if I need to um, get a thinner stuff. Man, steal my licks. If they're useful to you, then go for it. <laughs> you know, I did do um, a couple of videos actually on, like I think I called them five killer licks. And the first one did really well and the second one did okay. Um, but yeah, I was surprised that people wanted to know licks from me. Do you know what I mean? It's, um, uh, that's an honor. So if you, if you get something out of anything I play, that's awesome. Because believe me, I stole all my licks from someone or another. Um, I remember my friend Lee Jackson playing a lick one time. He played this thing where he went. So it's just an A triad, an E flat triad up a tight tritone. Right, and it's sort of a gypsy thing. And I thought, well, how do I make that my own? So I went, right, that's four. And then I thought I could go. Kind of similar to Lee's thing, but I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I put it into seven? So I went one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and then the same. Right. Then it doesn't like fall down on all the down beats and stuff, and I thought, well, that made, made that lick my own one. So I kind of took his lick, and um, that was just something I saw him play one time, and I went, ah, thank you, got that. So I, I've stolen my licks from everyone, you know. I, I've stolen a heap of licks from Sko. Um, here's one I use all the time. 2, 5, 1, and G. Uh. Had to think about that. Starts on the flat seven. That's it, that. Flat nine's there. And this is Skolik that I stole. Um, it's from his tune called Not You Again, which actually <laughs> is a contrafact of the tune um, There Will Never Be Another You. Um, you know, which is a standard that people play all the, again, all the time, and it's like, ah, oh, not you again. <laughs> when someone calls that song, do you know what I mean? I really like playing it, it's fun. But, um, yeah, and it's funny, when I when I toured with Sko, I did a tour through New Zealand looking after him, and um, I actually called that tune, and he goes, he goes, can we play something else? <laughs> I should have known, it was just the first thing that came to mind. Oh, yes, I did start about the Robin Ford Diminished. Yes, you're right. Sorry, I got distracted. Um, yeah, so Robin Ford, I don't hear him using diminished in the, in the traditional sense, right? Like, meaning like a diminished, like like an old school approach of diminished. Like... Like that flat two thing. It's not diminished passing like that. What I hear him use it is like the, the flat nine sound, like the... Right? That sound, right? 
So it's essentially the half old diminished. We're just starting on A, go up a half step, go up a step, half step, whole step. And of course play it in one position and you get this. And of course it's symmetrical, so you go up a minor third, same shape. And then up a minor third again, and up a minor third again. So there's only three of them, right? And that's what I hear in music. And, and, and it's like a five chord approach, right? So here I'm using that as really like a jazz approach, but the thing I like about the way Robin Ford does it is it sounds it sounds like the blues, right? It doesn't sound like someone trying to play jazz over the blues. It sounds bluesy the way he does it. And it doesn't sound like a jazz player slumming it playing the blues. Do you know what I mean by that? Like where um, you get people who they try, they're a jazz player pretty clearly and they try and play the blues and it sounds like they can't really play the blues. They've got no background in it, no... Um, oh thanks, yeah, I'm amazed I got to 100 episodes. You know what I mean, they can't really play the blues and they sort of feel like they're slumming it to get themselves to that. And there's nothing worse than that. I don't get that from Robin Ford. I get that like the blues is, like he actually knows, he's listened to the music, right? That's probably what I'm trying to say. Um, and so, so that half whole diminished thing he uses, sure it's a jazz concept, but he makes it work in his thing of the blues. I always found it interesting too, his approach with the blues, that he said um, to him, it didn't make sense, the jazz thing and guitar. And I always thought, oh, that's interesting, because he was saying that um, if you think about some of the early jazz groups, there was no guitar. There was no trombone either. Like, a lot of times it was sax and trumpet and maybe piano trio, right? That was a lot of the early jazz groups. And then Jim Hall came along, and Jim Hall was probably the first guy I ever heard that really, really made the guitar kind of sit in a jazz quartet, like that Sonny Rollins stuff. Yeah, I know there was um, people before him, uh, West Montgomery, of course, but that was really making the guitar like it's the main voice. Charlie Christian, of course, people like that. Um, but West Mont uh, Jim Hall was really the first guy that I heard where I went, oh, okay, that's like, that guitar just fits in there and sounds like a jazz instrument. Um, and so Robin Ford was saying for him, it's like the guitar is the blues, right? We can do things like... And all of those things that that's so expressive with the guitar, you don't really do in a jazz context, at least he didn't. And so he felt like the blues was more his calling in terms of music because for that exact reason. I also thought that was really interesting. I sort of felt that way as well a little bit. I mean, I enjoy hearing straight ahead jazz, but for me it's like I like the things where I can let a guitar be a guitar. I want to bend strings. I want to use a bit of overdrive, you know, at least a little bit, like... I guess that's like for me why Sko has, been, has always been one of my heroes because it's like he's a guy that kind of did that but made it work and made it make sense right um, the bridge pickup thing is interesting in a jazz context like that too because the way Sko did it was like it was like it wasn't really heavily overdriven was it it's like you know just a little bit of overdrive it was like an amp that was really wound up loud I remember Bruce Foreman telling me that he saw Sko play one time and he was playing he, he said to me, I think his guitar's broken. And I go, what do you mean? And he goes, oh, um, I saw Sko play, and he had a Fender Twin, right? One of those Silver Face Fender Twins. If you've ever played through a Silver Face Fender Twin, you'll know that you can't get them to distort no matter how loud you get it. Sko's sound was distorted, and he was plugged his um, uh, AS2000 straight into the amp. No pedals, but it was still distorting and just at a lower volume and... I remember Bruce saying, his guitar must be broken to be able to do that, right? I always thought that was pretty funny. Um, maybe he just, that's just a thing, I don't know. Um, but 
yeah I've always liked that kind of tone that thing and it's like to me that's like a big part of the guitar so it's like that's why I enjoy the um the fusiony type things because it's like to me that's that's it's a music it, it it's a more expressive version of the guitar and the thing it's an interesting thing with that that bridge pickup thing that Sco does listening for with that is you'll hear it go just that point just before it goes yeah. I need to get this time pot control um, change to I found that the, this one one I have to turn it down that's on one really it doesn't seem to make any difference so like like until I basically turn it almost right off um, but now what happens is because I've gone with a darker tone from the controls, but I'm playing bridge pickup, so I've got the brightness there, but the darkness there. What happens is I have a more dynamic sound. And of course, you have all those colors that come from just like how hard you pick, right? Kick butt is what the tritone switch does. Yeah, it does. It's a, it's a it's a good thing, isn't it? It's like a, it just gives you another another color. Uh, good morning from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Ah, very very cool. Never been. Um, I've been to Malaysia. I've been to um, Kota Kinabalu and on the Borneo part tip of uh, there, but I've never been to the the other parts of um, Malaysia. I'd I'd love to go. I love that food. Um, one one thing when we were in there, um, my wife has family from from that part of the world, um, and so it was her uncle's ninetieth. We went over there for um, just amazing. We went snorkeling with turtles and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and I remember one thing that happened was we we went into the mall most days to go and you know pick up whatever was needed and um, the old lemon tea, you know that became a thing for me. I was like man because it was hot too, it was super thirst quenching and also like kind of did what coffee does. But, um, you know, giving you a pick-me-up. But you don't dry out like coffee. And the food. Oh, my God, I love Asian food in general. It's probably my favorite thing. Indian or, um, you know, Malay or Chinese food. Oh, so good. playing there will never be another you after I was just saying how that song is overdone um no, that was interesting almost so it reminded me of a country lick and I didn't mean to do that See what I mean? I'm just following my ear and I heard something, my, my ear heard something, so I went with it.
it's a fun tune. It's an interesting kind of premise, that tune, that, I mean, I remember students once telling me he thought that song was in C. And I was like, ah, oh. um, the trombone played kid up at the jazz school when I was teaching up there. Gee, I hope my phone doesn't run out of battery. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> How much juice have I got in there? Oh, 40%, we should be all right. Um, but he thought the song was in C. You have this vamp thing, right? Where are people tuning in from? Let me know. Bangalore. Oh. Right, um, let's see, he saw that as C. Really, I, I see that as the five chord. Really, we're in minor but it sits there for so long and that's where it gets confusing for people you know it really is a good case for using the harmonic minor Oh, you're tuning in from Thorn and Key. Oh, great. Does that mean you're at work? Because Thorn, Thorn and Key um, is down the business district end of Wellington. A place I dare not go during the day. <laughs> so, interesting thing there. That's actually, that's a Marshall model on the fractal that you're hearing. But you turn the volume down. sweet clean, to clean tone I really like that you know like using something that you wouldn't think normally for a clean tone like typically the fender amp is the, the kind of clean tone um, do you practice double stops in all modes yes I do absolutely um, I, I'm i a big fan of double stops um, I had a student come over the other day really, really gifted young guitar player and um, everything he did was single notes and one thing I said to him was you, you can't play more than one note at once and he went oh you know like pretty. That's right, wings. It's all just double stops. Apparently Paul McCartney played those guitar parts. I mean, I knew he wrote the song. Um, I was reading up about that and apparently he had a band lined up to go and do that album that, he, that they did. And um, he ended up firing them all or they all, or they all quit. I'm not quite sure. Um, like the, a couple of days before the recording, he just went and he just did it all himself and wrote like, um, play those things. I think he had, because he, he recorded it somewhere like Jamaica or somewhere un, unusual like that. And of course, you know, he just used various musicians that were local for the things he couldn't do and the rest of it just did himself. I mean that's some beautiful guitar playing. Um, it's an interesting one, if, if it's a good example of if you want to see like a really great guitar playing but terrible guitar sound, that's some of it. Like that, that guitar sound is really nasty, bright and just doesn't work. Um, but the playing is great and the writing is great so, so it works, right? And it suits, it has a charm about it. Um, 
Michigan. Cool, cool parts, you know. It's just a cool part, I mean. And let's look at what's going on there, right? It's root and third. Third up an octave. You could say it's a tenth if you wanted to. And then the melody goes up. It goes up a minor third, but the other bit only goes up a semitone. Right? And the crazy thing about that is now that note is going to go down. those tenths is kind of something that you see in classical music. But Blackbird doesn't sound like classical music, does it? Anything you want to hear, people? I think the guy that, uh, perfect speller, said, I think the guy that started the Paul is Dead theory was from my state or had a radio show here and allegedly was very vocal that he made it all up, but it was too late and it already caught on. Yeah, I, I see that a lot on the internet, right? I remember John Bon Jovi, so someone said, said, oh, John Bon Jovi passed away. And then all of a sudden people started sharing it without actually checking it to see if it was true. You know, and it's kind of really sad when that sort of stuff happens because, you know, like it went went around a lot. I remember seeing it, and I, the first thing I do if I see that stuff now is I go and Google it. Within two seconds, you can see that, um, it, it, you know, you can see that it's not true, and you go, okay, well, I'm not sharing that. But people do. People just share things blindly without even thinking about it, right? And then I, I remember John Bon Jovi made a video and said, look, I'm very much alive. This is me. This is video today. You know what I mean? Um, it's a real shame when that happens, you know, and it's happened like quite a quite more often than it should. I guess maybe it, it's um, the whole age of social media and people learning how to behave and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I was, you know, it takes a two second check to, to, to see if something's real um, before you share it. Um, yeah, so it was a guy from your state and he, and he said that he he made it up and he admitted to it. Oh, well. Um, if any of that is wrong, blame my boomer parents. <laughs> um, yeah, the, bo the boomers had it good, didn't they, really, in a lot of ways, when you think about life. You know, free education in New Zealand, you know, about the rest of the world, but, um, you know, the time when you could actually afford to buy a house for a reasonable price of money. You had one, uh, if you had a family, then the, you know, one of the, the husband could go out to work and the mother didn't have to. Nowadays, you know, I was talking to my daughter about that last night. But, um, you know, what's going to happen in her generation, you know, she, she's really worried about it as a 14 year old, you know, like, what's it going to mean when she's an adult and is she going to be able to survive is how she's thinking about it. And that's really sad that she isn't even has to feel like that. Anyway, don't get me started. <laughs> um, um, do you do you do a pick to no pick switch in a gig? Yes, I do. Sometimes um, what I do is the pick. I hold the pick like that. I know it's unusual. Um, sometimes I put my hand out like that. I actually, I find that really comfortable, especially for rhythm guitar. It seems to weight your hand in a certain way, like Corey Wong or Rob Harris. Um, Rob's, Rob's a big influence on my playing, especially rhythm guitar. He's a bad dude. Um, and I've seen him doing stuff like that, and I've, you know, kind of gone, oh, okay. So I do that, but sometimes I close my hand. Sometimes it's more comfortable. I mean, I change it around. But if I want to go from pick to fingers, what I do is I put the pick in that second finger right there like that. Right, and then that allows me full freedom of movement. I can even I can finger pick, 
See the picks there? Sometimes I put it there. That's harder because now it's locked those two fingers together. But if I'm doing something like Brazilian, like, you know, the bossa nova type stuff. Then that, that works perfectly fine because those fingers don't need to be independent. Now I can take it from there and go like that pretty easily and just bring it back to play. Yeah, and I've just practiced it. I've, I've make a, made a point of practicing going from that to putting it either between there or in that finger joint. This pick's getting a bit slippery. I've been using it for a little while. Um, I find too that once picks wear in, I got some picks made by the way. Um, daily videos on YouTube. I know, and they, they kind of wear out in an interesting kind of way. Um, but I find as they wear out, they actually, I like them better. I found that when they're new, they sort of grip. Maybe it's the the print material or something. Once it but once it wears down to what's underneath, and they get a bit of an edge, they seem to work seem to work better. Unless they get a little mark in it, and then then it kind of catches on the string, and that's no fun. You said, yes, I saw you do it in a video, but it takes confidence to do it live. Yeah, totally. So for me, it's like I don't even think about it anymore. I've been doing it so long that it's just like swapping from pick to fingers is a big thing. But, you know, um, what I would suggest with that is don't feel you have to. Like, you know, if you if you, if you can do it all with the pick, then do it all with the pick. You know, it's interesting. I used to, when I, when I comp, I used to always comp with my fingers. So I'd do things like, um, you know, instead of playing a blues and I'd be taking a solo. <laughs> my fingers and go and then I remember talking to Bruce Foreman about it and he was like why well, don't you comp with your pick and I thought I thought about it and I thought yeah actually that's a really good idea um, because the thing is like when you're comping it's it's about rhythm isn't it right if I think about how I'm, I'm accompanying a soloist the soloist doesn't need if they're a good soloist they don't need me to play the harmony right they they, they surely know what the harmony is right they don't need me to really do anything other than provide some rhythm and some some uh, some support for what they're doing right so the rhythm the rhythm is the key aspect and the thing i found is when i comp with my fingers is that it sounds soft and indistinct when i comp with a pick it's more percussive and more rhythmic so so i had a gig that night um and i remember john ray was the drummer i remember it really clearly and i did half of the comping with the fingers and then half with the pick. And I noticed it, like he responded differently as soon as I started comping with the pick. It was like, because I guess as a drummer, when they're hitting a cymbal, they're not listening to the tail off of the cymbal when they're playing. They're, they're listening for the initial attack when it hits, stick hits the cymbal. So when they're listening to your string, they're not listening to this part. They're listening for where it goes, ping, right at the beginning. Sounds very different. To... So you see what I mean? Like I'll, so I started comping more and more with my fingers. I uh, sorry with my pick. And then when I do use my fingers to comp, what I notice is that I'd use that when I want to do um, like a softer sound. Like say we're playing a ballad. Well, then I don't necessarily want to play like really heavy, very rhythmic. That's not the point. Like, right? I'll get more into. Whoops. Right? 
and um, I found that 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 might be so. I so I use the difference between going between my fingers and my pick as like a textural thing more than anything else now. So, um, but like I said, it, it, it does take confidence to do it, and you get used to it. Um, oh, they're wrong. And spread it anyway. Yeah, some people do that on the internet. They just spread stuff because they, um, you know. Sorry, my wife interrupted me, and I missed some of the picking discussion. I see you switch your picking under out. Wonder if your pick, if your pick slant. Right. So my thing with the pick is I keep my pick super straight. I actually did a video on picking recently on the, on the channel. Um, the way I do it, and it's not necessarily the right way. It's just the way I do it. Is I keep my pick super straight. Right. What what I'm going for, and this is something I've noticed, is it's very easy to make the up and the down sound different. Right. Just by the nature of an upstroke. Upstrokes sound different, right? That's it's, it's it's a different force on the string. So what what's harder to do is to make them sound similar. So my pick's super straight. And I'm trying to get them to sound similar. Now I can always make them sound different by accenting it. Right, so there was that out there accenting the upbeats I'll get the words out so I was accenting the upbeats there and I find that you know when you're when you're accenting the upbeats um, that that creates a certain feel about the music I work on accents quite a lot in my playing right I want to be able to accent wherever I'm playing through a phrase however I want to um, maybe I should do a video on accenting um, different things but uh, but I find that like to get them even is the harder part so so that's why I keep my pick quite straight now George Benson always turned the pick like that Apparently he did so because he thought he was listening to West Montgomery and he'd um, apparently, I read this somewhere or heard this from someone, that he didn't know that Wes wasn't using a pick. And so Wes had this like little marker, like a corn on the side of his finger where it had worn from playing, you know. So Wes, when he played the downstroke, would brush across the skin. And when he played up, it was like that hard bit of skin was hitting. So the upstroke sounded brighter. So Benson, apparently, that's what I heard, I don't know if it's true, but... He, yeah, here I am spreading misinformation, <laughs> not meaning to, I'm just sharing what I've heard, that he turned the pick to get try and emulate that sound that Wes had. What I find is also, like, the, and that's fine, but now it's like your picking default is the upstroke stronger. I want to be able to choose. I don't necessarily want the upstroke to down to be... I might just might want the the first beat to be accented and the end of one to be accented, right? Um. You know what I mean? I want my accents to be by choice rather than default. So for me, like just the way I do it is I try and get them as even as possible so my picks pretty straight. Right. The thing is I'm barely holding the pick at all. It's pretty loose. Right? I find if you kind of muscle anything, it doesn't really work. Um, so I keep my, my pick like I'm, I'm, basically if I was to hold it any lighter, I'd drop it. It's like just enough to get it to be there. And I'm trying to keep my arm as loose and as relaxed as possible. I've actually been working on my picking a lot lately. Um, I took a lesson with Jake Wilson, a really great British guitar player. Phenomenal chops in December of last year. And um, he gave me a bunch of things to think about with picking. Um, because, you know, my picking was feeling stale. Like I felt like I'd reached a thing I couldn't quite get above. And he gave me some things to think about. Um, and he talked about, one thing he talked about that I found was super useful was we often talk about tension. Like maybe, you, you know, when you when you get tense when you're playing, it's like you'll get tension in your shoulders or your neck. It's not it's not your hand, right? Or in your leg, maybe you'll tense your leg when you're playing. Or do, we do things like that just naturally, right? Especially the neck, right? Or jaw. Sometimes people go yeah, like that with their teeth when, they, when they're playing something difficult. And he talked about it and he said, okay, well, pay attention to that right and go don't go no tension or or fully tense right don't think that way think on a scale of like one to ten in terms of tension and go right what am i doing right now okay if my neck's feeling tense or whatever at the moment it's not but i'm not really maybe there i might go okay 
now my next, now my next tensing is not, but it could be in theory, right? And I'll go right. My tension there is we're feeling like a six out of ten. This is what this is Jake's advice. It's not, um, you know, I'm just sharing it with you. Um, and and he said instead of thinking like you know go no tension or tension, go well it's a six at the moment. How do I make it a three? Oh, that's an interesting thing, you know. And sometimes it's just just tell yourself to stop doing it, right? Like I just tell myself, R relax, you know, just. Because most of the time when you're tense, it's like it's all in your head. It's not real. So I go, to, I just tell myself, relax and just, you know, let everything. And I always play better. Right, instead of. It's like. You know, if you ever see like Julian Lage play, it always looks like it's effortless and easy. It's because it is. He's not trying to do what he can do, right? As soon as you try, it doesn't work. So he'll just play, he just does it because he can do it. He's such a fantastic player. One of my favorite players. Any tunes you want to hear? Stern to do that, have a have a note pedal on the top. Yeah, sure. Okay, let's do um let's say could could you take a standard and um talk us through a few improvisation ideas. Okay, so let's take a tune like uh, There is no greater love. So that, that's the tune, There Is No Greater Love. So the chord changes are, as I see it, there's a couple of different ways you can look at this, but it goes B flat, E flat, A flat, G, then C7, and then C minor, F7, right? That's the basic gist of these, the first A section. Let's just take that much. So something like that, I would kind of work on going... right you see right 
But then, so I'd work on arpeggios and and um, that kind of stuff, and then I would uh, and scales and all that kind of stuff. But then I'd try and look at like what what can I do with that chord progression, right? If we look at this, right, that E flat could just as easily be an A seven. So now I have. That's cool. Right, now look at trying to find some lines that I can play through. trying to see how I can kind of weave my way through it in a nice way, right? A way that kind of makes sense. So that's something that I would look at. Um, I would try and find a theme, right? If we look at the, the tune, right? I might go, and I kind of made it a theme and try to put it through the chord changes, right? Because then it's kind of thematic soloing instead of just like random, right? I'd probably have some licks worked out. Right, and this is like a bluesy type thing. Right. This is one I use a lot. It's just C minor 11, C minor 9. And it's just A diminished to lead to the B flat. Right, use that both in solos and also comping. And I find that, you know, like having some things like that worked out um, really helps because. It's like it's a starting point instead of it just being like, like you know, blank canvas and where the hell do I start? And it's, it's one thing that a lot of people struggle with jazz music is they go, there's this blank canvas, what do I do? All right? It doesn't have to be like that. No, nobody really fully improvises all the time, right? I mean, the great players like Wes Montgomery probably improvised more than most. But even then, I mean, he still, he had his licks. If you go and check out anything that Wes does, you hear him playing the same vocabulary. You hear him playing the same tunes too, right? How many times did Wes Montgomery record um, impressions or Days of Wine and Roses and stuff like that, right? Like they were his tunes. And, the, and the re there's a reason that, that he did those tunes all the time. It's because he knew he was going to sound good on them. They became his repertoire. So I'd say that with standards, you know, people people always told me when I was starting out that you have to know thousands of, of tunes. And I thought, do you? Does West Montgomery know thousands of tunes? Maybe. I don't know. But the thing I notice about West Montgomery is the tunes he does play, he knows really, really well. He's played them a long time. He's recorded them multiple times. He's played them on probably thousands of concerts. And that that's kind of the key thing. So, so go deep with each song. They don't, you know... Um, when you hear bands play original music songs you haven't heard, is it easy for you to tell when they're improvising versus playing composed parts? Um, yes, it is. I can I can tell when people are, comp are improvising or not, but it, to me it's not the most important thing whether it's improvised or not. You know, I mean, I saw Steve Vai play um, recently, and Steve sounded incredible. And you know, for a large large part of what he does is it's it's set, and. I don't, I don't really care how people get to the music, to be honest. Improvised or not improvised, um, whatever, as long as it's good. That's all I really care about. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the thing I think you have an advantage of when it comes to improvisation is that you're, in, you're playing in the moment, hopefully, right? And if you're in the moment, then you can react to what's happening and you can, you, you can uh, give the people... You can take the audience on a journey in a way that I think composed parts don't quite do the same thing, right? Um, although that depends. But um, yeah, I think that I think that it's um, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, I, I don't think it really matters to me whether it is improvised or not. 
yeah, seriously. Um, but um, I can I can tell. You can tell when someone's doing it. Like, um, have you seen any of those guys on Instagram that play, right? You see these Insta Instagram guitarists, like whatever an Instagram guitarist is. <laughs> and you see them play and you know they've worked it out 100%. You hear them play and they're acting like it's, you know, the caption will say something like, uh, live gig, improvised solo. And you know it's not. You can tell it's not. And what's worse is they play with a crappy sound with a load of reverb so it kind of hides all the notes and all the flaws, they don't play with particularly good rhythm, and then they go in and logic in the, um, or Pro Tools or whatever they're using, and they edit the heck out of it, right? And like, they, they edit every single note, um, and they, they present a performance as if it's live when it's not, because it's been edited to heck. And they make it sound like it's super tight, when it's not. Um, and then you just, and you think, well, you couldn't do that live, right? That's just lame. I don't know. Um, thanks for tuning in, Chris. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so to me, it's like, if you see any of my stuff, like, I don't, I don't edit these videos I put on YouTube. Um, like, when I started doing the daily thing, I said, right, it's going to be, um, not audio, at least anyway. I'll, I'll cut between shots, you know. Um, essentially, I'm using my phone, and I do one angle, um, and then I'll crop in on it and add a little bit of sharpening for closer view. But there's no audio editing. I'm not going in and fixing any notes or whatever. It just is what it is, right? I have to play it. And I do one take. I don't go back and do other ones or whatever. It's like, I don't have time to do that. So, um, And same with those Instagram posts or whatever. I just put them up there. They're not that. If I was putting out an album, then sure, we might, might do more than one take. But even this album here, you know, that I played a track from, at the beginning of the stream um we wrote these tunes m many of them the day before we jumped in the studio um we did it in la so we booked a, um dylan's rehearsal room and we jumped in there and we had nothing really and we just started sort of fleshing out some ideas and we went okay what if you, you play this you know and what about this chord progression what if we take a blues and do this whatever and maybe ben will play some chords on the bass and we go ah there's some chords let's take that and run with it and we sort of did that for maybe three or four hours and then we jumped in the studio the next day and we um, essentially played everything down once and that was the first take. Often that was the one that ended up on the album. A couple of them we did a second take. You know, maybe someone went, oh, I didn't quite get this bit or I want to change this or what if we put another bridge in? We sort of, because we're arranging on the fly, right? Um, and then also like a couple of bits Ben wanted to overdub mostly because if he did a bass solo he wanted a bass line underneath him or some chords like he had this crazy pedal that was like a uh like a phasery type thing um and he used that and he played these chords up high on his six string bass and they sort of sounded like a Fender Rhodes like that Donald Fagan thing you know the um Steely Dan sort of electric piano sound and it, it was awesome and then he put that under his solos or the bass line under his solos you know because because he felt a lot of times when he was soloing it's like the bass line would drop out so therefore he'd overdub a bass line in a couple of places but for the most part we just did it like that and there was no going in and fixing individual notes or any of that kind of stuff it's like it's just you know i'd love to one day actually do a record and do um just go in and treat record digitally as of course because we're not going to record just that but tr treat it like tape Go in and go, right, we rehearse, we're ready, we're done, we've got these tunes written. Now we're just going to do a take. Beginning to end, it's cut, it's done, and then go straight to two track and just be done. It's mixed as it's done. It'd be an interesting process. Although I've been thinking more and more lately about what's the point in doing albums anymore. Right? I mean, do people buy albums still? Doesn't really seem like it. Maybe the older generation do, but um, I think people want singles, right? I've been thinking maybe, maybe instead of putting out an album... You know, this album here has seven tracks because they're really long. And um, maybe um, maybe the way to do it is to go, um, instead of doing seven tracks or t 10, 12, let's say 12 tracks on an album, you know, do one one single per month, put them out that way instead. Because I actually have been working on an album for about four or five years now, and it's just been put off, mostly because I've been unmotivated, like what's... It's felt a lot like, what's the point in putting out an album? Um, and I was going to have guest guitarists on it, various friends come and play solos and whatever. Um, I had talked to Mark Leteri about it. Um, he had said, yep, he would do that. Uh, I had talked to Rob Harris about it. He said, yep, he'd do that. This is, we're going back a while. I talked to Ariel Poston about it. He said he'd play a slide solo, which would be like, it'd be amazing. Um, 
various people like that that I've met over the years, um, um, fellow guitarists, guitar player friends. So I thought, you know, that'd be cool. Um, Blackstrap Blues, Warren, I'd love to get Warren on it. I'd love to get Leon Todd on it, people like the Ben Yunsen. Um, I haven't talked to them yet about it, but that, that'd be the thing. But I've just kind of been thinking, well, what's the point? And so I'm thinking, well, maybe I should just put a album out and just do it um, as singles and just do it on YouTube and it is whatever, you know? I don't know. Let, let, me, let me know your thoughts. Anyway, I'll play you one more tune and then I probably should. We've been going for 93 minutes. So I really appreciate everybody tuning in. It's really awesome that you have. Um, I'm going to play you out on, on a tune now. Um, I don't know what I'm going to play. I'm just going to improvise something and see where it goes. But there will definitely be a tune in there somewhere. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in. Yeah, um, I don't know if they're still doing it, but I love how Jack White's Third Man Records was doing live shows straight to vinyl with bands at his Nashville store. Yeah, I think that's such a cool concept, isn't it? Definitely more of a rock thing than a jazz thing, but it could work for the jazz thing, couldn't it? Like, maybe people should do that. Like, go and do some jazz records straight to vinyl and, you know, it has a certain sound. I really like, like um, vinyl. Oh, thanks, yeah. I'm amazed I got to 100, 100 of these. I thought for sure something was going to happen. I thought my phone was going to die. Because I record these all on my phone. I'm on my phone right now. Um, I am actually using a proper audio interface. I don't know if you can see that. Um, I got this Mackie big knob here that's like an audio interface. I'm USB into my phone. I wasn't willing to compromise on audio. I have a AT4050 here, microphone. I'm running a DBX mic pre here um, because the pre preamps in this are not great. I'm running the fractal into there in stereo. Um, over here I have my iPad on a stand. Um, so yeah, I do it all on my phone. I was worried like one day I was like, oh man, my phone's going to die. And then, you know, I could get out the real cameras and do it, but that, that's going to be really slow. 
um, and it, you know, take a lot more time, and then that that would make it even harder to do every day. But I mostly got to hundred with these, so I'm gonna keep doing that. So, um, thanks for that. I still would like to buy physical media. I do too, right? Um, or at least download options so other albums get my votes. Oh, thank you. So another album gets my vote. Um, yeah, I like buying CDs too. I like having something physical. I don't know. I mean, it seems to be a thing that if you if you buy a download, does it feel like you really own it? It's just this thing that exists on my phone. It's convenient, and I do, you know, I do listen to them a lot of the times. So like probably more than anything, I listen to stat music on my phone with my little um, um, noise noise cancelling earbuds. You know, um, but do I really own it? Whereas if I have a physical copy of a CD, this thing, I feel like I actually own it. Oh, it's crazy. Like, I can touch it. Do you know what I mean? Or it is like a digital thing. I don't know. It doesn't... It's the same thing with movies on it. Apple, you know, Apple iTunes or whatever. Um, or Netflix. I've sort of felt like, do I ever... I just feel like, like... I feel like when I'm watching it, I'm just essentially renting it for that moment. All right? Same with MP3s. If I'm listening to an MP3 on my phone or whatever, I feel like it's just... It's like a rental for a minute. As opposed to... To really owning it. I like CDs. I think CDs sound better too. I remember we did this gig one time and the sound man had some music on him. He was dialing in the PA trying to get it right. And it just sounded like mush. And uh, the, one of the, the guy doing monitors came over and said, I've got this on CD. And he um, put the CD on. And the comparison through a big PA with subwoofers, you know, had two massive big subs, was night and day. The MP3 just sounded like complete mush. And then the CD was like crystal clear and... You know, it really does make a difference to the sound quality. And um, we did a gig in the weekend at this guy's house. Um, it was like a 60th birthday thing. Um, I guess he had a bit of money to be able to get a band come in and do it. Um, and he had this incredible sound system. Put it on, put on some Steely Dan. It was just like... Um, and it was the stereo separation of it and the clarity, you know, was just unreal um he had two big 18 inch speakers on the bottom it looked really weird like these big cone looking speaker things but um it sounded pretty amazing you know um and you know had you played mp3s through that just wouldn't be the same yeah that's like physical media to me it's i don't know um but in saying that i don't like having the cases for all the cds i put store them away and i just put them all in a cd wallet and half a cd sit the only cd player i now have is in my van so when I'm away in the camper van, then I put CDs on, which actually works really well because if you're somewhere where there's no reception, CD will always work, right? Anyway, thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate everyone tuning in. I appreciate your comments. I appreciate people who've watched the 100 episodes so far. Um, like I've always said all along, the reason I do this is for you people. If people are willing to watch, I'm willing to keep doing this. Um, and you know it, it takes time like it's time consuming but i enjoy it and i enjoy doing it because i enjoy seeing people get something from this stuff you know what i mean um so i'll keep doing it you know let's see how long i can keep going let's see if i can get to 200 or a thousand episodes what should i do for a thousand episodes all right i was actually thinking maybe i should even get in um some friends to come and play um you know get in a bass player and come and talk to them about music and what they expect from uh, from a from a guitar player or that kind of stuff could be really useful. Maybe just play some music together. Um, can you hear the dog yawning outside? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking I might do the live streams regularly. What do you reckon? Should I do that? Maybe once a week. Sunday could be really good. Sunday in New Zealand, Saturday in the US. Um, that could be really good for me um, and maybe for you too. I don't know. Maybe that's the thing. Um, I'll have a think about it and see. Anyway, thanks so much for tuning in. Like I said, I really appreciate appreciate you all um, and everybody's kind words and things. And, um, you know, hopefully you've got something from this. And um, I will see you tomorrow with Guitar Daily 101. Cheers. How do I stop this? Hope to see more for sure. Really, look. oh, thank you. And I stop. I guess I'll do that. Yes.